Do you want to use cursors in your COBOL DB2 application? If your answer is yes, then do watch this video till the end because this video clearly explain the underlying concept of cursors in COBOL DB2 application. Hey guys, welcome back to this session and in this session we will talk about cursors in DB2. So we start today's session with an introduction to COBOL DB2 application. After that, we will talk about what is a cursor and why you need them in your COBOL DB2 application. After that, we will talk about what are the different type of cursors you have in DB2. And thereafter, we will focus on what are the different stages of DB2 cursors and how exactly they work in your COBOL DB2 program. In nutshell, we would be discussing the entire life cycle of a cursor in your COBOL DB2 application. Then we will deep dive into a sample COBOL program to understand how you can define each stage in your COBOL DB2 program to accomplish your business requirement. And finally, I'll be discussing couple of SQL codes that you should always consider when you're writing your COBOL DB2 program. So let's get started with an introduction to COBOL DB2 application or program. As you know that host language and database are two separate entities and their working principle is also different. But that does not mean that you cannot combine the capability or the functionality of these entity into a single program. Now let's say you're using COBOL as a host language and IBM DB2 as a database. So you can very well write a COBOL DB2 program or an application that can execute the business functionality and on top of that can access data from the DB2 database with the help of an embedded SQL statements. Now as you know that a COBOL DB2 program use embedded SQL statement to access or to store data in your DB2 database. When these statements are executed, the output or the result of an SQL statement is stored as a result set and this data can be accessed by an application program with the help of DB2 cursors. In some cases, whenever you're using singleton select statement, the result is written back to application program with the help of host variables. And on top of that, DB2 use SQL return codes to indicate whether the recent execution of SQL statement is successful or it had failed due to some internal error. So in nutshell, a COBOL program that access or store data in the DB2 database by using embedded SQL statement is called as COBOL DB2 application or program. Now let's try to understand what is a cursor and why you need them in your COBOL DB2 application. A cursor in DB2 is a mechanism by which you can access data row by row from the result set or the table. And the COBOL DB2 application program use DB2 cursors to navigate through a set of rows that is returned by an embedded SQL select statement. A cursor can be linked to a pointer that keep a track of all the records in the result set. So as a programmer, you declare a cursor and define a SQL statement for that cursor. After that, you use cursor in the same way as you use a sequential file. So in nutshell, you declare a cursor, you open that cursor in your program, and then finally, you fetch individual rows from that cursor. And once you complete your processing, you close that cursor in your application program. And all these different stages of cursor is called as life cycle of a cursor in your COBOL DB2 application program. We're going to discuss all these stages in detail, but before that, let's try to understand why actually you need a DB2 cursor. Why can't you use singleton select statement? Because singleton select statement are better than DB2 cursors. So being a programmer, as you know that host language processing or database management working is absolutely different. They are two separate entities and their working principle is also different. But you can very well combine the functionality of these two entities into a single program. You can write your business logic in host language and you can use SQL statement to store and retrieve data from the database. 
So the major difference between SQL statement and host language program processing is that SQL statement operates on a set of data and they will return a set of rows that is multiple rows depending on your selection criteria. So it means that if you specify a criteria that is satisfied by a single row then the output would be a single row and in case if your selection criteria set is satisfied by 10 rows, 20 rows or n number of rows then the result set will going to have n number of rows and in case if your selection criteria is not satisfied by even a single row then the output is simply empty right now on the other hand you have host language for example COBOL, Java, .NET or any other language for example C, C++ so all these language are capable or are designed to process even a single record at a time they cannot process set of rows at a same time and this is the scenario where you need cursor otherwise your program will fail with an SQL code minus 811 that means for an individual select statement you have multiple rows and your program is not capable of handling those rows at the same time due to this fact singleton select statement cannot be used in each and every scenario and you do need cursors in those specific scenarios where your SQL statement is returning multiple rows at the same time. Now let's talk about the different type of cursors in DB2. So based on functionality the cursors in DB2 is divided into two separate categories. First one is serial cursors or non-scrollable cursor and the second one is scrollable cursor. So let me give a brief description of each category and I would be publishing a separate video on the details of each category so that you can understand how you can define those cursor and how you can use them in your program. The simplest type of cursor is a non-scrollable cursor. It always moves sequentially forward in the result set or the result table. When a cursor is open it is positioned before the first row in the result table and when the first fetch is executed the cursor is positioned on the first row. On the other hand you have scrollable cursors and they provide the ability to scroll forward and backward through the data in an application program. And the best part is that you are not required to write any additional piece of logic in your COBOL DB2 program. A scrollable cursor has simplified the life of a programmer. You can easily navigate through the SQL result set. And the best part is that while defining your cursor as a scrollable, you have to use an additional keyword that is scroll keyword. Now let's talk about the different stages of cursor in your COBOL DB2 application. So the entire life cycle of a cursor is divided into four different stages. First one is declare, second one is open, third one is fetch and the last one is close. The declare statement is used to define cursor in your COBOL DB2 application. It actually assign a unique name to the cursor within that particular program and you can use this name to perform different operation on cursors. And remember the declare statement does not execute the SQL statement it actually defines the SQL statement. And most of the time you get this question in your interviews. People generally ask, okay, is declare statement executable or not executable? So the answer is that it is not executable because actually it is not executing any SQL statement. It's just defining that. Now the next stage is open. In this stage, cursor is open and it is ready to retrieve data from the result set. Now the important thing is that open statement is executable statement. It reads the SQL search field, execute the SQL statement and sometime builds the result table. But it does not assign any value to the host variable. And this is the important point because when you open the cursor, it generally set the pointer. It never retrieves any row from the result set. And again, this is an interview question because people generally ask this question in interview. Okay, what will happen? when you open the cursor, do you get value in your host variables or is it just setting a pointer? 
So the answer is that you are just setting a pointer. You are not fetching any data because fetching or retrieving data from the result set or row is only possible when you execute the fetch statement. Now let's talk about our next stage that is fetch. In this stage, data is retrieved from the result table and you should always remember that you will get a single row at a time and the retrieved data is assigned to corresponding host variables. And one more point that I want to highlight out here is that in case if result table or the result set is not built during the cursor open time, then it will be built during the fetch process. Okay, so this is something that happens internally and you will never encounter a situation where you can actually see what is happening behind the scene. So finally, when you execute fetch statement, it will always retrieve data from the result set. But important point out here is that in case if your result set is empty, that means none of the record is satisfied by the criteria that you have specified or there is no data in the table, then your result set is empty. And in that situation, when you execute fetch statement, it will result a return code of plus 100. That means there is no data to be retrieved from the result set. And in that case, you have to make sure that your program is capable of handling that particular situation. Otherwise, your program will fail. Finally, the last stage of the cursor lifecycle is close. And in this stage, the close statement is executed to close the cursor, which eventually release all the resources that is used by the cursor. Now let's look at a sample COBOL DB2 program and try to understand what are the different syntax that you need to include in your program in order to define all the four stages or the complete life cycle of a DB2 cursor. So this program actually generates the list of employee whose salary is greater than 50,000 euro. So if you look at the program, you have individual sections that is used to write your business logic. So first section is identification division and it is generally used for documentation purpose. That is it outline your programmer name, your program name and other relevant information. The next section is working storage section and this section is generally used to specify your variables or file structure that will be used within the program. So in this section what I've done is I've used exec SQL statement to include my SQL communication area and other relevant SQL statements. So first statement or first segment is to include SQL communication area and it is generally used by DB2 to communicate with your application program and all the return code of individual SQL statement that is executed by DB2 will be sent back to your DB2 program with the help of SQL communication area and I've created a separate video so I would request you all to go back and check that video if you want to understand what is SQL communication area. The next statement is declare cursor statement and again it is specified between exec SQL and end SQL and the syntax is declare cursor name followed by cursor keyword. Thereafter, you have an SQL statement which is used to specify the column name and the table name followed by the selection criteria. So in this case, I've specified the criteria as salary greater than 50,000 euros. So all the employees who have the salary greater than 50,000 euros will be included in a result set. The next section is procedure division section and it is used to include your business logic. In this case, the first statement that I've included is open cursor statement and this will open your cursor that you have defined in the working storage section. The next statement is a fetch statement and it is used to retrieve data from the result set. And remember, it will fetch one row at a time. The retrieved data is assigned to corresponding host variable. So if you look at the declare cursor statement, you notice that I'm fetching three different columns. First one is employee number, then it's communication department, and third one is salary. So if you notice my fetch statement, I'm actually using three different host variables. First one is H employee number, second one is H com, and third one is H salary. So all the data of three columns, which is fetch from the result set, will be assigned to these corresponding variables. Right, and all these variables are already defined in your working storage section. 
and in general the fetch statement is included in loop so that it will keep on executing again and again till you have no more rows in your result set so for example you can use perform statement to it could be an outline perform or inline perform and it will keep on executing fetch statement again and again till the condition is satisfied and finally once you're done with all your processing you issue close cursor command that will close the cursor and release all the resources which is used by cursor and as a programmer you should always ensure that whenever an SQL statement is executed you should always validate the SQL code to understand whether the SQL statement was executed successfully or it had failed so in this in this sample also I've just showcased that I'm checking if SQL code equals to plus hundred that means there are no more rows in the result set so my program should not fail either it should throw a message or it should terminate the process processing. So ultimately you should make sure that you should consider the important SQL codes while writing your COBOL DB2 application. And guys remember the code which is highlighted in this particular slide is not a complete code. In this slide my intention is to highlight the code corresponding to each stage of a cursor right because rest of the logic you can very well write as per your requirement and that has nothing to do with cursor stages. Now before discussing the SQL codes I would like to highlight two important programming tip that you should always consider whenever you are using cursors in your COBOL DB2 application. First one is regarding database updates and in case if you want to update data in DB2 table with the help of cursor then you should always use for update clause in your declare cursor statement. If you know the column name for which you want to update the data then you should mention for update of column name. In case if you don't know the column name or you are not sure of the column name then you can use for update. Now the next tip is related to cursor with hold option. So as you know that whenever you issue a commit statement the cursor will be closed automatically. But in case if you want to keep your cursor open then you can define cursor with an hold option. In the following example while defining cursor I've used withhold option and this will keep my cursor open even if I issue the commit statement. Now let's talk about couple of important SQL codes that you should always remember or you should consider while writing your COBOL DB2 program. So the first one is minus 805 and it indicates that an application program attempt to use a DBRM or a package that was not found in the plan. To fix minus 805 you should ensure that your collection name or the package name is correctly included your DB2 plan. Second thing that you can try is that you can recompile and bind the COBOL DB2 program. And third thing that you should ensure is that you should verify the load library and the parameters that you have specified in your JCL while executing your COBOL DB2 program. The next one is minus 811 and it indicates that the singleton select statement is returning multiple rows and program is not capable of handling more than one row at a time. So there are two different ways through which you can fix minus 811. So first one is you can use DB2 cursor so that you can handle multiple rows at the same time. And the second way to fix this problem is you can use an additional clause that is fetch first row only. So whenever you execute a singleton select statement with an additional clause fetch first row only will always return single row and that can be handled by your COBOL DB2 program with the help of host variables. The next one is minus 818 and it indicates that the timestamp of load module and DBRM is not matching and the simplest solution to fix this problem is to recompile and bind your COBOL DB2 program. Next one is minus 904 and it indicates that the SQL statement cannot be executed because the required resource is not available. To resolve minus 904 you must verify the identity of a resource that was not available and you must go through syslog to determine why the resource was not available and in some cases you must contact your DBA to identify the actual cause. In most of the cases if you 
restart your program after some time it will work because it doesn't happen that your resource is not available until unless there is some problem the next one is minus 911 and it indicates that the current unit of work has been rolled back due to deadlock or timeout situation and the possible solution to solve this problem is that you must go through your db2 master lock to find out the process which is actually holding your db2 locks and in case if it is required then you can speak to your dba to find out the actual problem the next one is minus 922 and it is actually an authorization failure error and you should always make sure that you are using the correct username or the plan when you are passing all these details in your jcl Next one is plus zero and it indicates that your SQL statement is executed successfully without any issue. Thereafter you have plus hundred and it indicates that there are no rows or data as a result of an SQL statement. And it can happen that in case if you're using cursor and your cursor pointer is already at last row and again if you issue fetch then you're going to get plus hundred. And there might be a possibility that if you're using a singleton select statement and your where condition is not defined properly, then also you might get plus 100 because that criteria is not satisfied by any of the row. Next one is minus 501 and it indicates that your cursor is not open, but you are trying either to fetch or to close the cursor in your COBOL application program. To fix minus 501, you should correct your program logic by issuing the open cursor command before issuing the fetch or close statement. The next one is minus 305 and it indicates that the null value cannot be assigned to the output host variable because you have not used null indicators. So in this case, you should always use null indicator variable whenever you are referencing a nullable column in your SQL statement. The last one is minus 803 and it indicates the duplicate value of index and this occur whenever you try to insert a new record or you want to update the existing record. And the solution to this problem is that you should report such kind of issues in your error log and you should continue with the processing of the program. So this is not a complete list of SQL codes. This is just a handful of important SQL codes that you should always remember or you should always consider when you're writing your COBOL DB2 program. I would recommend that you should go a complete list of SQL codes and decide proactively what all SQL codes you're going to use or you're going to handle in your COBOL DB2 program. So this marks an end to our today's presentation and I would request you all to do subscribe to our channel because we need your support to grow our channel. And in case if you have any feedback for us or any suggestion, then do mention that in the comment section and I'll going to respond back after this presentation. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this particular video. Thank you.